Well, normal full cream milk, you would find that it would it would would have gone hard. <laughs> but not. Oh, you know, George will be happy. George is here. He's always saying to me, "Why don't we have a cup of coffee now?" I said, "No." The front door was open. Yeah. Good day, Squire. Good day. So, what do you want? Oh. Uh, PNC. That's okay. No, he took the wrong one. You took the wrong one, but he was happy to take the other one, so it's all done. Uh, have you got some unsold lots of mine? Yes, yeah. I'll get them for you. George, do you want a cup of coffee? Cup of coffee, George? Cup of coffee? Tea. Tea. I'll, I'll get it. Oh, I'll get that There you go, guys, if you want to put some coffee and milk in them. Here you are. Yeah, that's Listen, I try to, with the next lot, I try to email the, the list three times. I've um, made so many mistakes. Just bring them in, like you used to do, George. You got can them I, with can you? I, can I give you a lot? Can yes. I give you a lot for Yeah, give me a lot for the next it's auction. Something. It'll be the January auction. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, you I could have used them in the auction that's just starting. But... Okay. Uh, the list is there. There's some banknotes in here in this magazine. Mm -hmm. And there's the coins. Okay. And the list is inside. I'll find it. Okay. Thank you, George. Okay. <laughs> it's on recording. <laughs> you can no. start whenever you want. <coughs> George, you want milk in your tea? No, he's got a good price. He can't eat with his mouth, though. Um, <laughs> a little bit of a demonstration, okay? Hmm? You, do you want to take over as president? The AGM team? Yeah, I've got some. <laughs> I've got some stuff to show, right? Okay. Uh, in, in a minute, we'll... Hmm? We haven't started that bit yet. No. <coughs> have a seat and we'll just, <coughs> just, we'll just get it started. Oh. <laughs> I don't think you heard you. No, it should be. Do you want sugar? You're battering me up. So that I can stay, can stay at the front. Well, that's, that's a guarantee. That's a dead set, sir. I'm just reading what I'm saying. I'm sorry? I just read this and I said, look, Rod's already told me I'm staying. That's pretty right. Well, I'm not staying at the front. Well, that's a so we're having a dress rehearsal for the Christmas party, are we? Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, you'll come after Gosford for it. We don't let we don't have that beer, are we? So we've got to have this. Oh, did you get all have alcohol free beer, did not we? I'm in fact I'm going up to Newcastle tomorrow and uh, we tried in there. And I, I think this is much more civilised with a cup so of coffee. I don't go in the, <laughs> the peak times. Mm. Sure. And generally, yeah, that way, um, that way no one falls asleep. Uh, well, you hope. If I go very early in the morning, like you know, seven o'clock in the morning, I thought Frank. I see these. Grant and Frank would be here, but. Know, oh, yeah. so, Maybe they're still downstairs with the um so if I take words out to the airport to send in a state, my best routines to go um I get up at three o'clock and go at four Okay, John, let's over get this show on the road. Eh? <coughs> <coughs> You've got a chance. <coughs> Gentlemen, okay, let's go. Let's, the meeting is starting. Can, can everybody um, look this way? Especially if that sorted. Just because just because you're having a cup of coffee doesn't mean that we're finished with the meeting. <laughs> you haven't said order in the court though. <laughs> it's, okay. I've been it's all right. I've taken a set. <laughs> Okay, welcome everybody to the Australian Numismatic Society's meeting um, number 
1,212. Um, we have apologies to Peter Atherton. He's, he's still a little bit sick, I think. No, no, no. he's just scared of COVID. Oh, he's scared of COVID. The, because Harpoon Harry's on the corner <clears throat> had one case of it two months ago, Pete doesn't want to be near it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I suppose you know, Peter probably has you know, um, a sort of a low immune factor or something. Mm. Let's and go, Ron Bolden. Ronda Bolden, too, I'd say. No, Ronda, Ronda's no longer a member. So yeah. Ron's just the member now. Oh. They didn't need to both be members. Okay. Well, was both, yeah. Yeah. David Mead, Barry Towers, Colin and Sandy Pitchfork. Hey, um, I, I was down at um, Noble's the other day because I was in the city and um, and uh, Jim Noble told me that uh, Colin's been, um, he doesn't go into work. That's right, he does it from home. He does it from home. He yeah. and Sandy and do Sandy, it from home. So, you know, like he's, he's being sort of very cautious too. Because of COVID, is that right? Yeah. Well, Colin's, then again, Colin's I actually, when I last saw him, he's aged a lot in the last... Mm. Last year or so. <laughs> yeah, no, but but he looks at where it's, you know. You're looking good, gosh. Look at the calories. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Glad that he's going to be president again, isn't it? Good. <laughs> He'll last another year. <laughs> You're still standing, you can do it. <laughs> okay, Lindy Hall, uh, Matthew Lloyd, um, and, and John Minukas. John Minukas, okay. Is there any other, anybody that can sort of. Um, I guess. Since Frank and Grant aren't here, we'll put their names down, yeah. and Mari Brad as well. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> general business. Um, the meeting on the 12th of October is here again at the Philas House. The topic um, next month is Australian Predecimal. So George, you'll have plenty of things to, to show, right? Yeah. Members' choice. Okay. Oh, no. Australian pre decimal. Australian pre decimal. Um, yes. Rod's organised auction 41. It's now open and we'll, um, it'll be. Is it, is it, on, is it online yet? Yeah. Yes, it's online. I put it online last night after I got the last lots listed. Mm. And uh, okay. it, it closes with the meeting it next month. With the October meeting. <laughs> uh, the end of Money Fair is not, un, is not likely to be running in October. Um, well, the same as um, Petersham. Um, now I did speak to somebody about Petersham and they said that um, they believe that the, um, the council who own the hall of Petersham have, um, have uh, decided while well, no one can use it, they decided to renovate it. So mm -hmm. that might sort of add to, to the, to the um, closure of Petersham uh, Fair because um, by the time they can't... Eh? That's a row, isn't it? Thank you. And by the time they finish doing the renovations, it'll probably be about five years down the track. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, any other general business? Yeah, the IB Ness. I was concerned that it was fragmenting because we haven't been able to have meetings at um, mm. gyms. <coughs> so, a mate of mine's inheriting a church. And uh, it's called the Old Church Bookshop, Marsden Road, Carlingford. A lot of history about it. Yeah. And uh, he actually gets the cemetery as well. It's kind of rather, rather intriguing because when the um, when the people were given the, the land for the church, they then approached the fellow. Can can somebody remember? Is it Mobs Hill Road that Channel 7 was in or something? Mobs Hill. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Mob. Uh, anyway, Mobs. I mightn't have this exact right, but apparently Mobs owned all, a lot of the area at Carlingford, around Carlingford. So he was willing to give a block, uh, some land to the church. Anyway, the church no sooner sat up and said, there's not enough room for a cemetery here. So he gave them another lot down the road. So this mate of mine's inheriting both. And the first person that was buried in the cemetery was Mob. So 
Um, as I say, it's a historic building. Okay. Went down, had a look at the other day. I put up to the IBNS, I suggested Phyllis might be a go too, but once again, the um, committee are all COVID worried about COVID. So they think it'll be good in the interim before they go back to um, gyms. Mm. And I'll see how it works out. So we're having our first meeting on the 11th of October on a Sunday between 11 and 1 p.m. There's parking around nearby and, the, and then we'll go off for a, uh, a luncheon if anybody's interested. Okay. Marsden Road, um, Carlingford. Okay. I dare say Tony will Tony. Pardon? I, said, I dare say Tony will send up an email to all the members. Sure, sure. So, um, it, He's up in Tamworth for whatever reason at the moment. Yeah. And Trevor Wilkins, who's got the darn shingles. And you know, sometimes I've rang him up and oh, it just sounds absolutely dreadful. Yeah. Shingles yeah, isn't got, good. Did, did he say <laughs> where he's got the shingles? You know, is it on his head or around his tummy or back or he didn't say. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's just that there's some places where you get it and it's real bad. I remember my old man had it on my head, and that's a very bad, bad place. Then, really, because obviously. But I've had that. an injection for it, and I asked him why. You know, has he had it? And he said, no, he didn't bother because you know, some of his friends have had it and still got the shingles, but not as in, not as bad. Correct. But surely it'd be wise to have it. You can also get an injection for pneumonia. Yeah, yeah. that's what Carol yeah. got today. Yeah, I've, I've had that. Yeah, yeah. Pneumonia and pneumonia. shingles. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Usually goes with the flu. For, yeah, for well, us fossils, you I get the three. Out, I got my flu <coughs> injection and said, did you know you can have an injection for shingles and pneumonia? Mm. I didn't know. No. Yeah, pneumonia. Pneumonia, pneumonia cockle. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> It's the intensity. <coughs> so there we go. That's what we're doing with the IBNS, just to get it going again. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. like I know, this place has uh, been successful for us. Do they charge us a rent? Uh, yes. What what rent is it? Seventy-five bucks a month. Seventy-five. Yeah. Uh, well, I've I've done it. Cut a good deal. It's only twenty-five bucks. Seventy-five here. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> so we come here eight eight months of the year, but it's handy. Oh, for sure. Well. Yeah. I put it to them about this place, but they said, oh no, they don't like the air conditioning idea. But the air conditioning is not even on tonight, is it? No. In the summertime, you want like the air conditioning the on. They, they like the idea of getting away from the city environment. Yeah. The, the only trouble with getting away from the city <coughs> environment is that some people travel by public transport. Yeah. And it's not that easy. If, yeah, but they can. We'll arrange a, arrange a roster where we pick them up at a, a nearby railway station. Yeah. That's not Carlingford railway station, are you? Not now. There's not one. That's right. It's gone. No, well, there's one at Hornsby, and there's one nearby. It's Epping. Epping. Yeah. Epping. Yeah. Epping. <coughs> um, a bit of general business, um, I don't know whether you've all heard it or not, but the Royal Australian Mint have been doing a fair bit of advertising uh, lately <laughs> on the radio as well as on, um, you know... Um, the volunteer the, dollar? Uh, donation dollar. Donation dollar. <coughs> right. No, they're ugly. <coughs> they're, um, they, they've produced this, um, this uh, dollar coin. It's, it's, it's nothing fancy. Um, no, it's got a green colour on it. Yeah, it's got blue. Is it? I thought it was green. I'll blue. see if I've got a picture of it. I didn't know whether it's blue or green, but the ones I've seen on the thing are blue. Oh. Uh, but they only made three million of them. No. Everyone? That was if you, what was um, stated. That's what it looks like. Donation dollar. Well, that's green. It's green to me. Yeah. yeah, it's got a green circle around it. But that's what it is. Give to help others. What's that one? That's the, all that part there is all green. Right? right? But the whole idea of this donation dollar is that if you get one in change, they would like you to donate it to a charity. 
Right. I reckon it'll go into collections and another another coin will go into salvos or something. Yeah. Right, so that's, that's the theory, but then if you listen to the advertisements on the radio, they are saying that they are going to produce enough for every Australian. Well, yes, I think from last time I heard... 26 it million 26 of us. Million. Yeah. <laughs> Australians. <laughs> so they're sort of suggesting that maybe they're going to produce 26 million of these things? Well, maybe not every year, though. I mean, know. you know, they might just keep producing yeah. it. Well, maybe. Yeah. But I think and then you'd have to collect it by the date, you know. Donation dollar this yeah. year, donation dollar next year. Um, be, a, be a red one or a green one or a purple one? Or yeah, well, maybe, maybe they're going to change them. But, um, you know, they, one of the things that I read was that, yeah, that initially they were going to make three, th three million of them. Um, but now they're saying on the radio that they're going to have enough for every Australian. So, who knows just exactly how well, many... Well, there might only be three million Australians left. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're COVID finished. No, <laughs> now! <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, um, yeah, so if you, if you see them, um, yeah, the theory is that you're supposed to donate them and they'll, they'll go back into circulation once the, um, once the, the charity... Um, puts it in their bank. I'd, I'd say um, you'd be lucky to see one. They'd yeah. all go into collections yeah. straight away. I'll go straight into collections. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the people that uh, a lot of the dealers that buy out of, direct out of the mint are really annoyed because um, the mint basically said no. It says every one that they produce they mix them in with normal no. um, one dollar coins, yeah the kangaroo coins. And um, the dealers are not going to get access to them. So there'd be no uncirculated uh, <laughs> dollars. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so you'll have to get one and slab it. Sure. It's a bit like the AUS dollars for 2019. Yeah. The yeah. make out to the tongue. Oh, oh, I, I, I still get them occasionally in change. Yeah. yeah. Well, same number. Mm. Well, yeah. Professions. Yeah. I, I, I picked up about yeah. five or six of each yeah. in, yeah. in change. For us yeah. poor old buggers with their eyes. <laughs> Just as a, by the way, did you see the coin magazine? Oh, I believe the coin dealer Close Ford passed away. Yes, oh, really? yeah. Yeah. quite a while ago. Yeah. Oh. A few months ago. Yeah. yeah, a few months ago. Yeah. Oh. So Klaus Ford's passed away. Colin Narvath died too. Yeah. Number one member of the obvious. Who? Colin Narvath. Oh yeah. Wonder what will happen with Klaus? Is somebody going to buy his lot and none of his keep it going? Or? No, I don't know. He did, you know, like in, in, in the you know, in the past few years he's had he's had somebody working pretty closely with him. Um, you know, the, the at the different coin fairs that I've seen him at. Um, so you know, maybe that guy's gonna take over. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Right. That's the way it goes. But um yeah. Alright then. Um any other general business? No? It's a copy for you as well. Mm. It's my report when we come to oh. AGM. I thought it was the one that you read for me. <laughs> 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 All right, well, listen, um, if, um, if there's no other general business, um, as we said, um, yeah, the, uh, we, we, ha we haven't heard from the end of people as to whether they're going to have it or not. On the website, it's listed as as running, oh. but because it's run out of Melbourne, it's unlikely. Yeah. So okay. it's it's touch and go, but it's probably not going to happen. We're, we're just too close mm. to it to to it really taking taking off. Mm. Sure. Okay. Well, I've been I've been watching very intently about the about the, the situation with um, the World Money Fair which is coming up in end of January. Um, it's only four months away and so they'll have to make a decision soon? Well they are sort of still saying that it's kind of that we gonna be on. But um, yeah I doubt very much that I'm gonna be able to get there because of a number of reasons. Well can you get there? Well, and if you get there can you get back? Well, well, just tell them you're Tony Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> <You'll be wrong. laughs> then you get stoned. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, but, um, yeah, like, the, the, 
the consequences of going away for two weeks was bad enough. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, if, if all of a sudden, you know, I've got to go over there and be isolated for two weeks and then come back for another two weeks, and it'll be a six week off work. No, not going to happen. So, um, what am I going to do about getting my my euro coins if you're not there? Uh, got some friends over there. You got you got some plenty guys yeah, over there. <laughs> I can't do John will just get twice as many the year after. Yeah, I'll just <laughs> get them the year after. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, that doesn't look like it's um, because you know every 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 week it's um, you know something else happens and. Well, Europe seems to be going through a second wave now. You know, you yeah. sort of look at. France and, mm. and, Spain. and Spain and mm. all the yep. numbers are coming up again. Yeah. Ge Even Germany. Germany as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching the Tour de France and I'm just waiting for that to um, yeah, cop it in right. some form and they'll cancel it. They'll stop it, but they've only got about a, oh, no, eight days to go. And they're, they're outdoors too. You know, it's not as if they're indoors. Yeah, but they reckon if teams get it, the teams are definitely out sort of thing. And what happens is a pile up. I mean, gee whiz, <laughs> they're not keeping a meter and a half, are they? Or even in the packs, they're not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, look, and um, we'll um, we'll suspend the general meeting and um, we'll open up the um, annual general meeting. Right. So we'll go with Rod's treasurer's report. I've given everyone a copy of the treasurer's report. I stupidly made ten copies, thinking there might have been ten of us here tonight, but there weren't. So. Just to read it all to you, this has been a year with a lot of disruptions. Since March, when the COVID-19 virus arrived, it's been very difficult to have gatherings and our numbers at meetings reflect this. As per recent years, our membership numbers keep dropping. The 30th of June, our membership was 157, including 17 complimentary, so it's really 140 members. Today it's 153, we're still the 17 complimentary, and I expect a steady decrease in numbers as we're all getting old, as, all getting old and a, a few members are still to renew. Here's a, just a list of what we did last year. The July 2019 meeting with, had a distribution of the Pillar Dollar Medal. The topic for the night was ships are numismatic. And at that meeted, meeting, we started video recording our meetings on YouTube. Also, auction 37 closed. So it was quite a milestone-setting meeting with the uh, YouTube s start. August 2019 have a topic of France of Louis Fourteenth, And David, me, and Rudy Talmax showed a great selection of medals of the period. Chanel Noble and Sandy Pitchfork came with Colin and Jim and Bob Glimpson and they joined the ANS at that meeting. I haven't got their renewals yet but I'll chase them. We were advised that Bob Roberts had passed away in August and many of us went to his funeral. September 2019 was our AGM. The same council was returned then and no doubt will be returned again tonight. The topic for the night was numismatic clubs and society medals. We had a fairly good turnout. The October 2019 meeting was members' choice. We also organised the roster for the Ander Money Show at the Town Hall. Currently, I'm not sure there will be a money show this year. Personally, I doubt it. November 2019 meeting was at Noble Numismatics, where Jim showed us the highlights of their coming auction. December 2019 meeting was the usual competition display in Christmas Social and Rudy Tolmax won the best medal for his display of Dutch medals. I never associated Rudy with Dutch medals but you know he always associated him with French medals but he had a good collection of Dutch medals. January 2020 meeting was shrouded by bushfire smoke and the topic of the night was gold and silver and John was complaining because he had his his three silver one kilo bars. <laughs> you, you said you said you you wanted to show it at uh, 
you showed it the, the meeting before, not at that one, I believe. <clears throat> the East India Company Star Pagoda Proclamation coin was for sale to members. Auction 38 closed at the meeting, and member Tony Dalton attended and took home most of the ANS medals on sale. It was actually good to see Tony that night, because then I didn't have to mail this bloody thing two tons of, of stuff to him. He could take it all home. Um, February 2020 meeting had a paper money and polymers as a, as a topic. We were advised Sandy and Colin, Colin Pitchfork had lost their home in the, the holiday home in the bushfires at uh, Lake Conjola. March 2020 meeting was at Noble Numismatics and Jim showed us the highlight of his coming auction. Just as well, we we had it then because after that the virus took over and we didn't have a meeting for a couple of months. Mm. The April meeting was cancelled because of COVID and we had an online meeting by email and website. The topic was Spain and colonies and we got quite a few interesting articles that members submitted for it. So it was mm. nice to see that we could still communicate and have a bit of numismatics. The April meeting was also cancelled because of COVID. We had another online meeting by email and website. The topic was Spain and colonies. I just read that. The the um, June, April, May, missed out May. I oh, know. The the June conference was postponed to June 2021 and members were refunded the conference made payment. The May 2020 meeting was also cancelled and an online meeting was organised by email with articles on a web page. I can't remember what the topic was. There was a June online email for the conference and started a web page where we were showing one article every day from the 8th of June, which is when the conference would have started. And we managed to get 30 articles, so it went all, all the way through like to the 6th of July or so. So one a day, and it was... Every day I would link the, the item and send the email. And I got really good response from everyone on, on that, so... It, you know, quite a, quite a few people sort of suggested that when we hold our conference, maybe we should have this online item as well afterwards so that other members can can submit articles and things. There's no reason why not. So, you know, everyone else feels as if they're involved. The, the fact that the conference is now on YouTube, at the last conference we had the YouTube, we put all, all those eight um, eight sessions on eight different YouTubes. So they were quite good and I hope we have one in June next year and if we do we'll we'll do the same again. Um, if we turn over the page, that's page one, that's my sort of recollection of what's happening, I'll put on the treasurer's hat and tell you where we were at the 30th of June. As you can see, at the 30th of June, we had a net net money in, in the bank and term deposits, etc., of $53,524.27. We showed a profit last year of $4,748. And that was only because we didn't print anything. We didn't print any conference things. And we didn't print any reports. So... We, we saved uh, quite a few thousand dollars on the printing costs and because we didn't print anything, we didn't have to mail it out, so we Sign saved on. another another five or six hundred dollars in, in postage fees. So sort of the, the profit of four thousand seven you could have probably reduced it to one thousand five if if we had the the um, a, a journal and postage. Other than that everything else was pretty steady. Um, we had a lot more auctions. So we were running sort of two auctions a year before and last financial year we managed to run about 
three or four of them. So uh, we ran three of them, but they were bigger auctions. Uh, I went up from 80 odd lots per auction to about 140 lots per auction. So we were getting in more money. So sell, if you look at the top sales and postage for the auctions last year was $9,600. And payment to vendors was 8003 so we made $1,300 profit on the auctions, which is pretty good. Um, also, we sold a lot of um, items. We sold sales of books and medals. We sold $1,135 worth of books and medals. And the medals that we produced was only $831. So we're about 300 odd dollars ahead on those medals. But the medals that we produced, the $831, that was for two years worth of medals, not one. So you see we're, we're getting ahead. Um, the other day, earlier on last week, last Thursday I think it was, I received the next bunch of medals that we made from China. So this big three kilo box of medals with uh, 575 medals turned up. And uh, I took it upstairs. We never have to pay duty on, on these things. I'm always wondering why we're not hit for the GST. But I guess because it it's, has a face value of like $300 or so. And there's 570 odd of them. It works out like 50 cents a medal or something like that. And that's just the production cost of, of making the medal. If, if that stuff disappeared and we had to remake it, because we already paid for the, the, um, the moles and the, the postage and all the other bits and pieces that go with it, all we would be paying is 35 cents US to produce another medal. That's just the production cost. But with everything else added in, we're, we're paying like a 150 US to ship it from, from southern China to here. 150 US, so, you know, that's a, a lot of the cost. <coughs> yeah. Because I pay them by PayPal, which is so much easier, we were paying 4% PayPal fees as well. So that adds to it. But it's still a lot cheaper than trying to produce those metals here, which I don't think anybody can produce anyway, our, our metals, you know, the, the two different. The, the metals we produce, the, the basic metal is struck in a zinc alloy. So that's, that's the production. And then they plate it, the, the base color, and then they plate the, then they plate the, the little metal that it's yes, representing in that, that color, sort of gold or silver or, or copper. So there's two plating processes that go on. And I've asked them if they could do more than two plating processes, and they said no, with their technology now, they can only do two plating processes. But the result looks good. You know, I mean, I think our metals look really, really good. I mean, I'm biased, but, you know, I do think it, it comes up quite nicely, the proclamation metals. So, gentlemen, that's... That's where we stood at the 30th of June. If you turn over the page, you'll get to where we are today, 14th of September. So currently we have $54,923 in the bank and I still have three checks to deposit for membership fees for about a hundred and hundred and twenty dollars or so. So we can add another hundred and twenty bucks to that. So that gives us a profit of about so far one thousand five hundred for this year. And it brings our our total to about fifty five thousand something. Um, the bulk of the the funds are now in term deposits and each year as our term deposits run out, they get renewed again, but they get renewed 
for 1% or 0.9% or some, some piddly little, little amount that's not worth it. Uh, I sort of look back and thinking, I'm so glad that in the years past, I put all our term deposits in for five years. <clears throat> Every time one came up to renew, we added extra money to it and we used to renew it for another five years. So we, we still have three or four term deposits that are earning us two to th two to three and a half percent, which is a bloody sight better than what you can get today. <coughs> but as the term deposits mature, all we can do is add a bit more money and put them in for, for the best we can get. And the best you can get is 1%. Also, the, the, I used to put them in for five, five years because that gave us the, the most interest. But today, if you put it in for two years, three years, four years, or five years, they all give you 1%. So I'm putting them in for two years, hoping that in two years' time, when it matures, the, the follow-up might be 1.5% or something. It might start going up. We can only hope. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think I have a good, good answer for any question. Well, thank you for doing it. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I come to that back page later on. That's that's my topic for the night. Um, look, as far as the uh, president's report, um, I uh, I haven't written anything down, so I thought I'd add a little bit. Then um, you know, Rod's basically. Um, Gone through and uh, mentioned everything that's um, gone on in the in the society. I thought you'd have brought uh, last year's and read it again, and we wouldn't be any no, the wiser. Just changed the date. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even have time to do that. Um, yeah. So, but uh, one of the things that I've um, that I've noticed over the past um, twelve months, if um, yeah, or, or mainly since the past seven months, since um, since March, is that. Um, yeah, we have to really take it, you know, take our hats off to, to Rod because Rod has um, yeah. basically been the one that's um, kept this whole society going and kept it all together. He um, he's not only sort of started up a, a YouTube meeting, he's um, he's done all the stuff that he mentioned in here. Um, you know, he, he continues to do the the um, the auctions and he continues to sort of have um, online, um, yeah. Conference, um, you know, uh, they papers went well. and everything yeah. else, right? All this stuff, it's all because Rod has really been trying hard to keep us all together. You know, it's, um, you know, and I really do sort of think that we should be thanking Rod for all the efforts that he's been putting into this, um, into the society, because um, other societies, that, other clubs that I belong to, they've basically all just fallen apart. You know, everybody just sort of said, oh, we can't go to a meeting, so, you know, they, nothing happens. You know, and, and uh, you can see that everywhere. Yes, some of the, some of the um, clubs and societies, they try to get to, to keep going, mm -hmm. but because they can't have meetings, they, they just don't function. The NAV have had a couple of um, uh, Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. which I, I believe Darren, Darren Burgess was saying went quite well, so if the people here on on the computer if you if you'd like to sort of sign into zoom we we could try a, a zoom meeting because mm. the the zoom meetings are, are pretty good i've i've been on a, a a zoom meeting with the naa now walter bloom in in perth is the the president of the naa and he wanted to hand over the the presidency and this, the, the president, secretary, and treasurer were all in Perth. And they felt that they'd done it for three or four years. It was time to, to pass the bat on, on. So last year they said that was the last one. So Walter called this meeting um, oh, about two months ago when we had a, a Zoom meeting. 
and uh, there was six of us on it. There was I can't think, remember his name from from Auckland, no, from Wellington. Um, Darren Burgess in Victoria, a gentleman in South Australia, and a couple of them in in Perth. So there were, there were six of us, and it's it's quite good. It's like you see on television. There's it it's split it into six little little sections, and you see all all the different faces of the different people at the time, and you sort of each speak or up there, and you you can get up to. 15 or 25 even on this but if you get 25 it gets a bit bit crowded but you know any, anybody if we wanted to anybody who is online who there we could really have a an ANS meeting with you know people in America and Europe and whatever all there you, you just have to pick the right time the other person on on that um, NAA one was Ken Sheedy from Macquarie Uni. And so we were discussing Zoom and Ken was saying that he he attended a co Zoom conference that was held in the UK. And he said it was a very interesting conference but he said the only trouble is because of the time difference at half past twelve, you know, a little after midnight, he got tired and they'd just finished it, it just gone to like one o'clock or so over there, so yeah, yeah. he had to leave. So you've got to get your times right if you're going to have it for for a worldwide conference. But just within members, it's a pretty good idea. So, and and Zoom is a it's a very good good format. I find the images are good; it doesn't fade out. Whereas if you if you have a Skype meeting. Skype tends to lose sound or, or fade out, whereas Zoom is much better. You see that on the TV when they have Skype, Skype there. Yeah. It's, he's chattering on you. And suddenly stops. you don't hear anything. <laughs> yeah, uh, weird. Yeah. <clears throat> but Zoom, it, it's a far sharper image and well, from my <clears throat> my few times on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. But it, it's good and it's like I, I had a, a Zoom meeting with Darren Burgess in, in Victoria because Darren has put his hand up as secretary for the NAA and he was saying that he felt he was ha would be happy in a few years time to take over the presidency but he thought he should become secretary first I was thinking that's good because the secretary does all the work anyway yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Darren is a you know very good worker so be, had a bit of life there, which is good. Well, that's what I was basically saying. You know, like um, you know, for for the past seven months, when everything has gone in, into turmoil, you know, Rod's been the one that's always been thinking about, you know, sort of bringing our members together. And we did uh, the, the 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 conference. Mm. You know, if you, if you look at all the the different conference papers we got, they were really good. Yeah. And, yeah. I have to thank Rossi because he, he helped me out with quite a few of them because people kept sen sending in the stuff as PDF formats and I couldn't transfer the PDF format as an HTML format. I could do the, the text bit but I couldn't do the images okay. and my printer wasn't any good so I had to get Ross to keep printing things out for me. <laughs> worked well. Well, thanks Ross. Yeah, so, um, yeah, now, moving forward, um, you know, I dare say that, uh, you know, we, we all need to sort of start thinking of other ways of um, trying to bring more members back to, to meetings and, um, you know, trying to get them to interact a lot more. Um, I'm sure that, you know, if we start sort of um, putting it to the, some of the members that just simply can't come to the, to the Phyllis House, um, and if they are online, they will be able to sort of, um, you know, participate in the meetings again. So, you know, it's, I suppose, um, in one way, the technology is, is going to sort of um, bring us bring us together again. So, um, but, uh, yeah. I think we all have to go back and work on our vaccines. It's the only way to do it. <laughs> Excuse me, Rod, do you have to sign on individually for Zoom, don't you? Yeah, I mean, basically, 
once once or... once you have Zoom, On once you've installed Zoom, and say you and Tony and and John wanted to have a Zoom meeting with me, I was going to host one. I I would set it up and I'd get the Zoom sign-in code, and I would email it to you. Say here's here's the Zoom. So who's and all you do is you or, or Amon? No, we, we, you, you'd be already on there, and you'd already loaded Zoom into your computer, so you, you have Zoom access. I would email you the saying, okay, one o'clock, we're having a Zoom meeting at one o'clock, here's the, here's the link. So you just click on the link, and it takes you in, and you're there. You don't have to do anything else. It puts you into Zoom. Um, once you get in it, it, it'll bring it up, and then you have, have to click on a couple of the, the buttons to say, do you want your audio to be heard? So you click on yes on audio, and you click on yes on visual, so they can see you and hear you. And you're there, and as each extra person comes on, they got get added to the, the ones on the screen. And it just rearranges it. There's just two of you, you have half a screen each. And there's four of you, you have a quarter each. There's six, it's sort of two by three, etc. So it it can do that. It's, so you're it's, it's go pretty out, easy. You're all going to go out and buy 29 inch monitors. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have a little 12 inch monitor, like on a laptop. I, I've got a very, very somewhere. big monitor, but I always have two screens on it. I always have it split. So. I use one for one thing and one for the other. So whilst I'm talking on Zoom here, I could be doing a spreadsheet or something at the other side. You know? Multitasking. Yeah. Um, yeah, so getting on with um, my report, and you know, I suppose that uh, one of the other things that I really liked is it's a shame that we didn't have our, um, our, our June conference. Um, yeah, I was looking forward to it, and um, for months before um, COVID, I, I kept on sort of trying to get people to sort of, you know, go to the to the conference because I, I really feel that the conference sort of helps you improve on your on your collection because you, you hear and you you, you you listen to the different um, uh, talks that the members give, and they just you know they're, they're so. So everybody gets so enthusiastic about everything, and, and it's just fantastic. So it was a bit of a, a bit of a shame that we couldn't do it um, this year. But um, as Rod said, we're going to do our best to get out there um, in uh, June 2021. Um, we skip a year, so what? You know, we just move on. And um, I think that's just right. remembered something. We should have stood up for a moment's silence for Merv Meads. Ah yes, I'd for, Merv forgotten Mead. Merv. Um, at our conferences, Mervyn Meads is one of our Brisbane members, and uh, he and his wife Heather always attended the conferences. And uh, unfortunately, last month, Merv died in a, a boating accident in, in Queensland. He, he and his cousin went out fishing in this runabout, and a freak wave came and toppled them. And I think they both. I think they both. Died, I think his cousin. Yeah, they both died. Um, the the news report was that um, a nearby yacht um, plucked one of the people out, um, but um, he died a little bit later. And the other the other person, um, uh, yeah, died in the water. But I we don't know whether which one was Merv. So I don't know whether Merv sort of survived that little bit extra or, or what. Yeah. But I I, I had a look at um, online. On a, on a few occasions just after that thing to, to try and you know, see if they actually name Mervyn, but um, no, you know, I didn't get any information about it. So, yeah. I think um, it was Colt Thomas who phoned me to tell me about it and I sent an email to everyone. Um, I think Merv was the person who died first, who, who drowned in the water and it was his cousin who yeah. died in the hospital. Yeah. But, Maybe we should be upstanding yeah. for a minute. Well, that's all I had to report anyway, so, so we'll have a moment of silence for Merv. Yes, I'll miss him and, and Heather at the, at the conference. Mm.
Okay, thank you very much. The incident was well covered news wise on the TV and the like, wasn't it? When that happened. Yeah, it was um, it was right widely quite advertised quite on the quite news, quite but um, they never really yeah, they never really named the people. No, no I didn't think and that's, um, that was the big thing. But um, yes. Yeah. Who puts the red stamp on Yes, um, yeah, the Queensland well, members they, they tend to sort of yeah, talk to everybody, you know, talk to each other quite regularly. And um, I think that that's why um, yeah, they, they have a habit now of any time ANS Queensland want information shared to all their members as well as everyone else, they email me and say, can you let everyone know? So yeah. I get this email in and I copy it and off it goes. But Jerry Doyle's pretty good. He's, he's got a, a Queensland group email as well. Mm. All right. Well, listen. We'll, we'll quickly move on because things are, you know, times move marching on. Um, uh, okay, the council for 2020-2021. Um, Rod's um, indicated here that all the current councillors, except um, Rudy Talmax, because we haven't been able to contact him, are happy to continue as councillors. Um, um, if there's anyone here in the, on the floor that um, is interested in being part of the council or if they want to be president or secretary or something like that, we can um, quickly um, uh, yeah, <laughs> put your nomination in. Um, we, yeah, the, the I, I tried to rope Ross in as editor, no, but no. he's too busy. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> yeah. But, uh, we just, can keep trying. Yeah, I'll, all right, so um, since there was no other nominations, um, uh, all our councillors, um, including myself uh, as president, uh, Rod as treasurer, um, and um, the uh, other members um, are, are happy to um, continue on for another 12 months, um, so therefore they're all re-elected. Um, as we um, both pointed out that the ANS conference um, is scheduled for June 2021. So, um, you know, like um, for the next um, uh, 10 months, we'll be talking about um, all the benefits of going to the, to the uh, conference. So uh, just um, be aware of that's going to be happening. I hope by June the Queensland border is open. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, there won't be a conference. Yeah. She's a dreadful lady. <laughs> Yeah. Right, Premier. She's still got a pretty good following up there, evidently. Oh, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. We'll close the AGM, um, and we'll resume our normal meeting, our normal um, monthly meeting. Um, we'll go straight to the topic of the night, um, which was members' other collections. Hmm. So, um, did everybody bring something along for their other collections? Mm -hmm. George wanted to talk to, 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 to start, didn't you, George? Do you want to pick up your come and um, you can show us your... Um, uh, and it'll also be recent acquisitions as well as other collections. You got recent acquisitions or other collections, George? Thank you. I'll come back. Um, can you all hear me all right? Perfect. Yeah? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, if I could just speak about last month's meeting that I missed out on, I'd like to apologise for not coming. I got up early in the morning and it was a wonderful day. After hearing the good news that gold went through 2,000, 2,400 US, which was nearly 3,000 Australian an ounce, likewise with silver. So I broke into my safe, I got some gold, two kilos of post, post silver, and uh, some 50 cent round pieces, and I went to IS Wright, which is status coins and stamps. The new avenue is on Parramatta Road opposite the uh, University, University. Vet yeah. section. Um, 
One of the INS members, Dave Allen, was working for uh, Ian Wright for quite a while. To me, Dave Allen was probably the most knowledgeable and noted Australian numismatist or a world numismatist that I ever come across. He was a walking encyclopedia on coins, forgeries and, and everything. Unfortunately, they've got um, Parkinson's, Parkinson's and uh, he had to uh, leave. So I dealt with Mr. Wright himself, <coughs> Ian, and the Kruger ends sold for $2,850 each. The $200 coins for $780 each. The 50 cent round pieces were $13 and a kilo, a kilo of post silver. That's after 46, 46 onwards in Australia. 50% silver. Uh, $28.75 make a kilo. Virtually a florin was worth $4.40. He was paying $500 a kilo. So, uh, George, when are we going on a cruise? So, I was in <laughs> paradise. I've been waiting a long time to sell this slot. Yeah. And uh, after a meal and coming down in here uh, before uh, 5 o'clock, I got a phone call from the missus and she was lying on the ground. Unfortunately, I had to pack my bags, catch a train straight back, and that was the end of that. But How is she that now, was, George? Uh, she alright? How is your wife now? That was, uh, she was alright, just spent a couple of hours on the carpet. Which is the fourth person in the last 30 days in our area who, who have done this. Nobody home, falling over. Uh, one chap was two days, two days on the floor before his sister came up. She couldn't raise it. George, how does she uh, get in touch with you? How did you, yeah. what, how? She phoned him. How does she get in touch with you? Did yeah. she phone you? Um, a a anyhow, mm. Mm. Uh, uh, anyhow, there's a story of that on Dave Allen. Mm. We don't see him very often here at the meetings anymore. They don't see him at status no. very often either. Uh, He's retired. Can we just show a few little Is things? It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has retired. I'm, I'm not, not going to bore you with my Seven Seas album of Australian decimal and pre-decimal stamps. But instead, I bought some spoons. Ah, Shane uh, Rudy's not here. He'd appreciate them. <laughs> uh, I have acquired a quite a big collection of spoons. Ones, ones with stones on them, opals, a rubies. Um, uh, I have a diamond on one spoon. The Australian spoons with Nat Kelly, a very, very scarce one, which was banned with a Nat Kelly on the inside. These ones, nothing, nothing extraordinary. England, uh, Ireland, Canada, Fiji, Japan, uh, Spain, a very, very nice one uh, from Norfolk Island. Um, Berlin, Helsinki, uh, uh, Pompeii, Salzburg, Tokyo, one from Sharp Street, Kuma, a very, very nice one, exceptionally well done, and Salzburg. Uh, the other items were cigarette cards. Being a non-smoker myself, never smoked in my life, I have paid my school fees by playing marbles for cigarette cards for five, six years at St Mary's Cathedral in Sydney. This is a Players, players, cigarettes. They used to be a sailor on the, on the box. 
the price was one penny for the album. Um, kings, of, kings and Queens of England from 1066 to 1935 with a beautiful history of each and every one, one of the uh, reigning monarchs, etc., etc. Uh, Australian cigarette cards. Uh, what else would you have but horse racing? <laughs> uh, uh, these one here are, believe it or not, <coughs> they're called... Uh, Handy, hand, hand, handy hints, and etc., etc. Uh, horse racing, uh, jewelry, monuments, and everything else. The one that is, I went into this quite seriously at one stage, especially while in Europe is tankards, official tankards. This is the Australian Bicentennial, 1788 to 1988 tankard. On the back is inscribed the whole history of Australia, from the number of Aborigines to number of people killed in the Boer War, First World War, Second World War, Korean War, Vietnam, uh, inscribed the Australian Bicentennial official tankard with emblem and and. Uh, Certificate, only 7,500 issued, inscribed with Australian history, engraved with the number, Hallmark Melbourne, with a glass bottom. And this is the owner's certificate number on it, etc., etc., etc. If you have a look at it, you need a magnifying glass to read it, but it's a beautiful. Uh, and gravy on the on the whole thing. Can you? It's still really good. Yeah. It's pure, is it? It is pure. It's white. It looks like a baby thing. You shouldn't drink that. That'll give you gout. Well, Thanks, George. <laughs> Uh, just for the record, I have a German tanker from 1942 under the Third Reich. We are winning the war <laughs> on three fronts. We well, were bombing there. England, but England and other forces were bombing Germany. Uh, Rommel was losing his battles in the desert and we were having a bad problem on the Eastern Front fighting the Russians in the cold. Uh, and yet they put out a tanker for a victory. <laughs> so I got a few American ones, British, a very nice Australian one uh, for the Harbour Bridge. Uh, I got two of those. This one here is for sale if anyone's interested. Maurice, you got anything to show? Somebody else can go first. Somebody else can go first. Um, I've brought uh, them to uh, <coughs> just other collections and uh, can't really sort of show it, even if you look at it themselves. This collection that I've got is a bit of a joint effort with uh, my wife because um, she's always seen me rattling around the place with collections of this, that and everything else 
And, uh, and I've said to her, I said, uh, because she's a volunteer at Taronga, I said, why don't you sort of get a little bit interested in something to do with Taronga, um, you know, to, for a collecting item and so forth. I said, uh, I, can, I can help you with all this, uh, particularly with things like getting picture postcards and, and, and things like that, which of course uh, I'm a little bit interested in, I certainly was there when we started this. And so um, um, we've basically done a bit of that. And so when I've gone to sort of a meeting at, you know, at, at the picture postcards that have been on sale, I've had a trip through them and, um, and looked out for some inter interesting sort of Taronga ones, particularly the older ones, the ones that are sort of you would say are not um, politically correct, you know, where animals are being ridden on or sort of riding bikes and all sorts, which of course you're not allowed to do anymore, uh, for good reason I go along with. So um, that's, um, that's what I've brought along here. Um, there's a couple of other interesting little items. Taronga Park Zoo, there's a, a booklet there with what's happening with uh, way back in the... Uh, it's probably the 30s, I suppose, something like that. Um, there, so that's part of, part of the collection as well, or our collection, I really should say. And this is another one here with the popular guide, Wild Animals of the World, Taronga Zoo, price one shilling, <laughs> okay. And so here we go there with um, illustrated Australian animals and the like, and animals that were in the zoo, and a bit to sort of talk about it. And um, I also brought a badge, well, sorry, it's a medal rather than a badge, um, which is this one here, um, quite scarce. It's the uh, Taronga uh, T Zoological Park Trust. So you can imagine um, there wouldn't be a lot of those around because only trust members would have those. And uh, I haven't got a clue what it's worth. Fortunately, it was somebody uh, that Pat was sort of friends with from the zoo, knew I was interested in, um, in medals and coins and the bits and pieces and the like, and um, I managed to get it. So it's quite an, quite an interesting uh, badge. And believe it or not, I was saying to Rod were coming in the car tonight, I sort of, uh, out of all the sort of badges and medals and so forth that, that I've got, I don't have one from the Tronga Zoo other than that one. That's sort of interesting sort of thing, isn't it, when you think about it, that all the years that Tronga's been going, that they haven't punched out any sort of, that I've ever seen. Would well, you seen one? One. For the 100th anniversary, they brought out a medal. Oh, did they? Oh, oh, 100th anniversary. 150th or something. Right. Mm -hmm. There is one oh. middle one. Tony, aren't you forgetting that? It's not yours anyway, it's your wife's, isn't it? That isn't. <laughs> oh, right. that, 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 that's not split 50-50, that, that one. That's 100%. <laughs> 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 oh. I don't think it did because usually I... Um, you said not Amor's on it. Oh, oh, hang on, I've got Amor's on That's correct. Yes, it is Amor's. But yes, I was a good manufacturer as well. Yeah. So that'll get you in for nothing. And I, I got it for nothing, yes. Now, well, that'll get you into the Taronga Zoo. Well, they'll probably think I pinched it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I think you have a little bit more than that. They, they, I, I would think most people probably uh, would have never ever seen that because... You know what era it was from, roughly? Look, I, I think it's probably... Looking at the, the way the, the pin was at the back, I would think this goes back a bit, actually. Does I would it just say Amos or Amos Ends? Uh, uh, no, it's sort of a, it's not transferable, and it's it's just Amos of Sydney. Yeah, so that would be early. Mm, so I think that, um, I think it probably goes back, it could not be 30s and something like that, because I asked somebody this and they, they didn't know, but the condition of it, you would think it was made yesterday, you know, but anyway, that's it. So, um, so that was that. In here, I guess the best thing is to do for you to have a bit, a bit, a bit of a flip through it, but that's, that's, the, that's the sort of things that they are, see. And you've got um, these animals that are sort of riding bikes and all that sort of stuff, 
I can remember some of that when I used to go there, when I was this high. I guess some of you guys can probably remember the similar sorts of things. And um, we used to um, r ride on the elephant, of course. We all jumped on the back of the elephant and rode around. Of course, I told my kids that, or my grandchildren that, and they said, you went rode around the blinking thing on that? I said, yep. <laughs> and uh, and it was good fun. And uh, But of course, we're not allowed to do any of those things now, which I suppose is probably the right way to go. But I'll leave that there for anybody who wants to have a bit of a flip through and look at it. And um, that's a, a joint collection um, of Tronga. It has been said that one is a single, two is a couple, and three is a collection. <laughs> Whether or not I do collect this, I'm not sure, because I only have three of them. They are Zippo lighters from the Vietnam War era. Unfortunately, the three of them are fakes, copies or reproductions. I thought one of them was genuine, but no such luck. The only way you, I guess you can get a genuine Vietnam, Vietnam War Zippo lighter is to buy it direct from a veteran with a photo of him holding it and his service record. It's becoming very difficult to get them especially in Australia. Uh, in America it may be easier because they were the bulk of the soldiers who went to Vietnam. I don't know uh, if you remember a movie called The Odd Angry Shot with Graham Kennedy. Uh, in that there was a few scenes where a lighter was on a piece of string in their barracks and they used to use it naturally to light cigarettes. But when they left uh, they basically ceremonially cut the string and brought the uh, cigarette lighter back home. It was a symbolic gesture of while they were le leaving Vietnam, Vietnam really didn't leave them. What do they say? Well, it's the atypical type of thing that they basically say is, if I had a farm in Vietnam and a home in hell, I sell my farm and go home. <laughs> By the near the end of the war, I think the soldiers really didn't want to be there. The American public didn't want them to be there. And that was where, as most of us can remember, that was where the conflict in Australia and in uh, America uh, was occurring. They, you also get things like, let peace hold her way over the earth. And this is the one I think I thought may have been legit, but it wasn't. Other things that said, uh, this is Vietnam 69-70, if there must be war, let it be in my day so that my children can live in peace. It's a very interesting collection, uh, all sorts of political, uh, soci sociological uh, implications on them. And like everything else, if you want to collect something by the book, and yes, there is a book about Vietnam cigarette lighters, uh, it's just an interesting part of our history that finished. Uh, and. Uh, it's, as I said, it's rather difficult to get a genuine piece. I guess I've been told if you could go to Vietnam on a holiday, you can have your choice of what they have for sale, but they are all fo forgeries. Mm -hmm. I guess you could get to the, uh, a nice collection together of forged cigarette lighters, but I don't know if you really want to buy that. Can I show it on the, 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 the lighters? And that's about it. Morris, what, what got you to you to start collecting those? It was just, as I said, I'm not really sure that I do collect them. That's all I've got. Well, you got three, mate. Yeah, well, 
it's, it's just the era that they came from. It was the only lottery I'm really glad I didn't win when I didn't win uh, the ballot to go into national service for that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I did. Oh, okay. Well, I, I remember when I was studying mechanics at what was called night school, uh, there was one bloke there who sat very quietly, didn't take any notes, didn't ask any questions, and I, it just was an unusual way for a student to behave. We got to talk and apparently he did get called up, but he was going into the police force in October of that year and he would have got exemption. But he had to pretend he was going to night school so that he didn't get called up in the intermediate time. It was just things like that just happened. I missed out because of studying too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Isn't that a shame? I missed out too. I had to sign up for five years. Well, any out. questions? No, I've asked one. You've answered very well. Okay. It's Oh, I, I wonder Quite where, interesting. Where, where were the original ones made? In the US, were they? Or oh, yeah, they were all, all uh, officially issued Zippo lighters. And, and again, you can go into the history of the Zippo lighter. I can remember Zippo lighters when I was at school. Uh, I mean, question. with the Zippos, you used to be smoker, able to... Right. No, I'm not a smoker, but I do have... You could flick them one way, if you did that, it would open itself. There was... It was sort of yeah. cool if you could... <laughs> uh, yeah, one that was in a particular movie where they actually were able to open it with one hand and flick it on at the same motion. Yeah. And that, that's in a movie. Yeah. Oh, so you're saying they are issued to the... Trips. No, the, for that area they were just normally produced Zippo lighters and they got them engraved themselves. In a lot of cases, they put something, let's say they were on a, a ship that was serving up there, so they got something relating to the ship and they welded that onto the cigarette lighter. Or they just got engraved their own battalion number and their own company number and any saying that they wanted to put onto it. Uh, the or, um, origin of the term, Zippo, any ideas? No. Uh, 1930. Uh, this gentleman had the pattern for an Austrian cigarette lighter that he could manufacture in America, but he didn't know what to call it. The zipper had been just patented in America in the early 1930s, and he liked the sound of the word zipper. So naturally, he played with it and called it zipper. And that's how the name came about. It's a, interesting. I do have another five, six... Zippo lighters, please don't ask me why I have six lighters, I don't smoke. <laughs> but, Two collections. Yeah, uh, you're a collector. The, these <laughs> are the only ones that relate to the Vietnam War. Mm. Oh. I'm going to continue on about the zoo though, because I, I used to work down at the zoo. It was another part-time job just to, you know, help help the uh, poor Banky with his, I don't know what I started on, but it would have been in the 60s. I worked down there for uh, nationwide restaurants on a, on a weekend. And I, uh, the idea was to go around the different um, booths and supply them with whatever food, if they'd run out of bottles or drinking them, that sort of had a little red truck that I drove around in and there was phones around the place so I was able to ring the SP bookie as well to keep up with the <laughs> horse races, spend my wages and then my first job on a Sunday morning was to go into the cool rooms and there was still the cream buns left over from the previous day and just, neat, just neatly flick off the mouse droppings. <laughs> but kept, them, kept them right. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, with the truck, I knew I could get a reaction out of the elephants. So if I parked the, the truck, like the people are there looking at the, tr the elephant and the elephant's waving his trunk around, and if I parked the red truck behind the people, I was bound to start something. And because he hated the red truck. 
and he'd work up the greatest golly you could imagine and just <laughs> out he'd spray. They go, oh, jeez, you know, I've got this. But Ross got caught at one stage because he didn't get, the window didn't go up in the, in the <laughs> car. And I had to get away quickly. And when I got away quickly, the back doors opened and the bottles fell out. It was hard to get out and pick up the bottles. <laughs> he had a free go at me. But um, I then continued on at the zoo because, um, with medals. I ended up... Um, selling medals down at, at the, in the different kiosks. So uh, I, they, uh, I knew a lot of the staff down there and uh, was free entry afterwards as well. I think I've worn that out. I think they wouldn't recognise me. Either. But um, yeah, that were good days. Now why I, can't, I really can't be a, um, an editor to look after you as I'm still very much involved with this, and I'm um, the editor and uh, secretary for this. It, you, it's so hard to get people involved, but I'll pass that around. But that's our latest <laughs> one. And, uh, and, and this one, that, that particular note, I've got written up in the, uh, uh, the latest one, and you just wouldn't believe what's come of it. It was a Victorian postal note that was issued in Japan. And it came up when we did that uh, uh, conference and the uh, papers came in from people, one came in from this uh, Malcolm Johnson, and then he referred yeah, the to, to my, my article, and so we got talking to each other, and he's got a website which actually showed this. He, he was, it was just part of his collection. But what's astonishing with it as it's made out to a Rex Allison. And when we start digging about this Rex Allison, I could write a short story, you know, probably something like that for it. This guy would have been the, um, oh gosh, the collector of all time. Like, um, they've named, Colin had named, uh, uh, too old. I'm forgetting the names of some of the U.S. collectors uh, that were uh, incredible at the lengths they went to. But this black, this Rex Allison um, leaves them all for dead. Um, he he decided to get covers. It was interesting seeing Rod, and Rod's going to talk a little bit about covers. But this guy um, collected the covers for. Um, the air race in 1934 for the Melbourne, marking the Melbourne centenary from London to Sydney, to Melbourne. He got envelopes addressed to himself and like this person, he got, obviously got a friend over in, in Japan to, to do it for him. Um, well, each pilot brought a letter that, that was addressed to him with this centenary stamp on it and such. He ended up putting his display um, in an exhibition in Melbourne in, oh, I think it was 1936 or something <coughs> like that, and he was given the gold award. The, um, he'd gone to the length of getting the, each of the pilots to sign the, the envelopes to the extent where the only Australian pilot in the air race said he wouldn't sign it. So he comes up from Melbourne, mostly lived in Melbourne. He was, he'd been in the Navy and came up to where the hotel room that this pilot was in and just sat outside until he'd signed it. And so he got his signature and unfortunately that pilot died in an air, air smash a couple of years later. But he was then uh, given this gold award uh, for his exhibition and, and this was just one of many awards. And I found even medals that have gone through nobles that are attributed to him uh, by this McRobertson who actually sponsored, and that was the confectionery. So we've got photos of him getting, being presented with his gold medal uh, from McRobertson. And it goes on and on. He's down in, down in um, yeah. Tasmania and such. Um, 
he uh, his collection part of his collection was sold at Downies, and it was so significant that the um, uh, government bought it for the National Library, and so uh, it's just fascinating to see the lengths somebody goes to. Well, anyway. So my other, I, I thought I'd tell you about birds not seeing carols not here, you know, but they're feathered varieties, and oh. so I got involved with these. And you talk about collections. Um, when we bought this place in oh, 2005, it had an uh, empty aviary and anyway people talked us back into getting into birds. And we've been into birds as kids, so um, both of us. So we thought, oh, that's a neat idea. So I got these Indian ring necks, they bred, and, and, but they were always flighty. And then we ended up going, oh, we were shopping for a land, land suite and uh, went past this bird shop and I said, oh, you've got you to come in and see how neat this guy keeps this um, bird shop uh, at Gosford. And we got, went in there and one of these had been surrendered. And so instead of buying the land suite, we bought, bought, the, um, bought the parrot and the, and the cage, you know. But born sucker, born sucker. <laughs> that, was, that was Lola. And then, uh, so as soon as my mate saw me with uh, Lola, he says, oh, I, I've got the bloke who wrote the book on, on Eclectus, you know, so he introduces me to uh, this Ian Ward. And since then, I've met, um, uh, done a lot with uh, Dr. Rob Marshall. These all became my mates. Named them all. The, the, the names are just numerous. They go on and on and on. It's interesting how you can turn um, a collection... Um, well, the way I looked at it, I was turning um, these into thousand-dollar dollar notes, but making my own money. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're hatching out one. We've got to put that up if you may, can. I hatch out little pink things, bald as badges, about half the size of my thumb. And of course, uh, even it looks just like you, I Ross. I can see the resemblance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's staggering how strong they are at that age. See the, the, the little bit added on the end of the beak sort of thing? That, that gets them when they're broken out of the um, egg sac. And that's what they're doing. They're fighting for air. They use up the air in the air cell. And then they start um, pipping. And I've gone through some... Um, well, uh, you get romantic with these birds. You've got to, got to um, uh, mother them. And... Uh, Seen the ones starting to pip, and they sometimes use it like a, like a chainsaw. They can come out in, in, in an hour, or it can take 27 hours. But when, when you see some of them struggling, and they're supposed to come out with the beak, but sometimes you get them reversed, and you get ones throwing a leg out, <laughs> saying, I'm coming into this world, you know. <laughs> so, a breech bird, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so probably. But... Um, that's what I'm doing still at the moment. I'm still hand rearing these ones. We, we bred in um, 2014. Uh, I bred over 70 of them, and it was, they were easy to sell. And as I say, I, 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 the, of the best, the better ones, um, this particular variety. If you can put it on that, is a, a Bosmeri from um, Indonesia. But um, they only brought very small numbers of them into, into the country. They, they um, smuggle them in. And uh, I've had them, I've had people drive up from Melbourne and um, fork out three and a half thousand dollars for one that I've just bred. Mm. Much, what, what sort of difference are they in colours between them? Well, that, when they were first discovered, they first noted in a bird book, I've got a magnificent book, where they first noted in about the 1790s. And they always thought they were two different um, species. These are the hens and those are the cockbirds. But um, they thought this was the cockbird of a different species. So that gets me going there. Um, I won't bore you with cars, it's a, a, you know, I collect, did collect cars or something. But um, what I'm into at the moment, and as I say, it's, it's fantastic when, when you get something going, um, such as 
putting your hand up and, and doing the job, and I'm sure Rod would have stories like this, where you're in touch with people around the world. Now, I turned up this um, ch uh, child endowment order, and what it is is, is an early punch card. And um, the uh, note printing branch handed the printing and manufacture of the child endowment forms, which they produced in millions, but you know, very hard to find, um, handed over to IBM in about 1959. Got hold of this item, and of course, I, I've always got to try and work out some of these things, and they, they've got these with the with um, uh, postal orders. You've got um, your check forms. You've got the mica encoding at the bottom, you know, the bank banking system. Well, that was pretty easy for, uh, for me to work out. This one's got those slots in it. And um, I'll just pass that around. And that's for the punch card system. And lo and behold, you know, I've got a, a mathematical genius over in England who can um, decipher the code for me because I haven't found out anything at the Reserve Bank. They, they, they've got one example of this in their, their collection. Um, so we're de meanwhile we're deciphering that. But in brief reading today about the um, punch cards, goes goes back to the 1700s or 1600s. And I, th I was of the opinion that that was the first of the computers in the 1950s. Mm. But apparently it dates back long, long way back before then. Yeah. So that's, that's about it. Thanks, Russ. I've the story about those factors, Paris. Do they sort of lend themselves to sort of you know, human sort of... Yeah, 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 like I've got ones in there. I, I, I got it up to about 120. I've got it down to 80. If I got rid of them all, I'd put my hand up and be your editor. I, I just can't do it. <laughs> and the, um, uh, I've got them, when, when I, I feed them twice a day. And when I'm down feeding them, I've got them talking to me, you know. Um, How are you going? What you doing? You know, whistling at me and such. They're well, your mates, you know. I, I was up in yeah. Queensland and I went to one of those big places where they had birds on display there. Right. And I went in there with, uh, with my uh, mate from England and his wife and, and Pat. And I had a bit of a thing about birds. I thought it was stupid, you know, because I had coffee to know and all those sorts of things. And uh, I always go in and I talk to the blinking birds and I bounce around and go, <laughs> and all this sort of stuff. And I went into this aviary and there was, a, there was a lot of birds and there were these two there and they came down a bit low so I started mucking around with them, you see. The blimmin' things went and came and landed on my shoulder and I was on my head. And there were a lot of Jap Chinese there. And they came over in droves. Mm. Taking fa I, I probably a, a hit in China. Um, they took all these photos and I'm standing there with the birds and I'm scratching them and dancing around with them. There's all these people taking photographs and I've never forgotten it. And I thought, those birds were, must have been sort of tame to come and just jump on me. They didn't know me from bar, so I've never been in there before. So it's just why I was asking, do they sort of lend themselves to people? Maybe they thought I was going to feed them as well. I don't yeah. know. It, it was sort of one of those things. Well, I don't forget the day. They get trained. We, I was um, called in. John Singleton's built, built a phenomenal aviary up at his property at Strawberry, that's up at um, Mount White, it's called Strawberry Hills or something. But he's got a phenomenal aviary there and with people um, in attendance to keep it all going. And he lets them out, all those blooming um, macaws and African greys and he's got these, these got nest boxes in the bush with these uh, breeding in the bush and um, coming back. Coming back. Coming back. Uh, but it's, it's Dangerous stuff. They open the doors, they'd be as tall, the doors would be up to the ceiling. And out flies a hundred of these blooming parrots, all in um, a myriad of different species. species yeah. And within seconds, they go over virtually out, out of the um, aviary, over an escarpment. So they're out there all, they're all mixed up, 
and within seconds they're all they're all in their different um, species, like the blue and gold. Macaws will blue together, the red and green ones right. blue together. The um, African greys are on their own. It's quite uh, off they go. He pays, he forks out so much money um, compensating neighbours for the damage they do. <laughs> um, but anyway, they, they seem to be they seem to put up with it because he must pay well. Um, well, he's got a few bob, let's face it, but yeah. Yeah, and, um, they, and then they come back, but you've got to have parked your car in a garage or something, because otherwise they come back and they're, they're bored. They get, get on the windscreen, and if they get in the car, they'll just rip all the upholstery up and such. Mm. But uh, that's a, and I've, I've let a number out, accidentally, and I've got most of them back. They usually only fly about 100, 100 metres sort of thing and they hang around. And they do go right. back, eh? Yeah. Well, they know. And that, food, they, I know that's where their food is, mm. really. And I've caught them in different... But how they do them up in New Guinea, for instance, is, is, and they eat them up there, there's uh, tremendous storms and they love getting in the, in the uh, um, rain. In fact, People have got them as pets, take them into the shower with them. And um, they get wet and then they can't fly, or if they try to fly, they end up on the ground. So I had one of those Vosmeroy hens, you know, she'd only cost me about three and a half thousand. And um, I, uh, she got out, so I was pretty alarmed at that. But she got into a tree that was very thick with um, branches and such, I couldn't get a net around her at all. I went up the ladder and she just moved up higher and such. So I thought, no, I'm, I'm, I'm getting you back. And I remembered about the natives in New Guinea. So I got the hires and absolutely <laughs> drenched her. And, and she, was, she was right. We got her back. Good on you. So that's the funny farm up at, uh, yeah, where I'm from. Yeah. Okay, now I've given you all a handout of the introduction page of Perfins. Now, I collect stamps, but I don't collect just ordinary stamps. I have to collect stamps that have holes in them, perforated initials. <laughs> More holes than normal <laughs> ones, yes. Yep. So they're the holy dollar of of the stamp world and the perforated initials were started about the 1870s as a um, security device to stop theft in the in the mail rooms in the early days or actually not to that long ago you could take stamps back to the post office and they'd redeem them so stamps had a had a value uh, up to about 20 years ago, Australia Post would buy them back at 90% of, of face value. They don't do that anymore, so stamps aren't, aren't worth that much anymore. But to stop theft, there, there was these initials punched in. So the very first one was in Adelaide in 1880, and it had a, the initials D and J F for D and J Fowler Limited, and they were the very first uh, Australian perfin. Um, they Fowlers used to make um, cisterns, so you, you, you know your your toilets, your, your yeah, toilets right. and what next were, were Fowler ware and made by these people. So they they're still around. <laughs> so. I, I collected perfins, so I used to try and get as many. I, I've, there is a catalogue on it so that when you, you get the perfin, you can see the, the um, different hole formations and I'd identify uh, which, which number it is. But even once you've got the perfin, you really don't know what company it belongs to. You can have a jolly good guess, but is it or isn't it? So the only way you can, can be certain of the, 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 the company it belongs to is when you get it on cover 
on a cover which has the, the company name. And for example, this very first one, which I'll probably show you on the screen. Doesn't come out very well. Let's see if it comes out better if I get it there. So it's AA1 it's called. The the marking looks like that. There is a you can't see it very well there, but it's it's that marking on the stamp. And it's the Alliance Assurance Company, also known as Imperial Insurance. So these insurance companies they they have several different names that they they sell the different brands but they all all belong to a parent company uh, trying to find the there's probably about three thousand different private perfins of which less than half we know which company they belong to because we have have them on on covers this is a, a pretty common one. We've all heard of Anthony Hordens, most of us. So that is the perfin A, H, and S. And it's on that Tuppany stamp duty stamp. And there's Anthony Hordens and Son. So it, it, it was seen quite early on. It's a fairly common perfin. You can see I've got it on quite a few different different stamps. <clears throat> but there are some some perfins are very hard to get so there's different rarities amongst them. The, a couple of years ago I decided besides having the the stamps. I also wanted to get them on either card or cover that would be approving. And once you have the perfin on a cover with the company name, it's called approving cover. So it proves that that perfin belongs to that company. So proving company, proving covers are quite difficult to get. Here's a, another fairly common one, A and R, Angus and Robertson. So I've got it on on the, the proving cover on on the back of the cover. It sh shows Angus and Robertson. Uh, on the pages that I put up, I want a stamp with the initials on. That's the pattern on that, and then I'd like it on a cover and then I also show some of the other stamps, other um, different stamp ones I've got. There's a myriad of different ones from all around Australia. This one is BSNL Limited and it's a company called Baggett Shakes and Lewis. It's again South Australian stock and stage and stock and station agents. It's another, it's been used from 1899 to 1925, so they've seen cancels on the stamps which have that over those dates. It's a common, common one, so it's not difficult. And this is my proving cover for that one. Um, B and T1 Bankers and Traders Insurance Company in Sydney, Pitt Street. So, again, I've got it on one of their policy forms. Burroughs Welcome, it's a pharmacy. Again, it's a pretty common one. The, the trouble with um, these is until you get a proving cover, you're really ne never sure it really belongs to that company. You, you can say, okay, it's DJ and Co, it has to be David Jones, but until you, you've got the cover to prove it, it's just, uh, just a guess. Are there catalogs on this? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a phone book thickness catalog. Is, is this a Cinderella section? So. Well, they, they are genuine stamps, so it's not really Cinderella's. C Cinderella's are usually made up stamps mm -hmm. and things. Made so. up stamps by her, the government? By any, any, anybody. Anybody. Mm -hmm. so, so Cinderella's are, are made for fairs and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, so they're, they're not official, they're, they're unofficial. Whereas these are genuine stamps. You got a vacuum the, oil company one? Yeah, well, oh, vac did. vacuum, vacuum oil has about 20 different markings because each of the main cities had, had their own. And you have, with vacuum oils, there's some VOC in one line, then there's VOCO in one line, then there's VOCO on the next line. There's, there's about 20 different markings, so it's, it's, it's all over the place. One of the, the hardest ones, well, not hardest, but one of the most unusual ones I've got three albums of these, so there's, I, I've, I've got 150 odd covers, so that's my listing. When you're flicking through, Rod, make sure you look for ones addressed to this Rex Alice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. When, Not important, I tell you. The, these are the ones I have, so you can see there there's VOC4, VOCO2, VOCO5, VOC, VOVO2 should be VOCO10, VOCO11, VOCO12, so there's at least 12 different vacuum oil ones. But this is my list on cover, so I can't take the three albums with me. If I, I'm going looking, I'll just take this cover page and try and find what I'm missing. But they're not easy to find. Uh, one, some perfins, uh, I'm, I'm, there's 3,000 perfins. I'd, I'd probably have half of them. I'd probably have 1,500 different perfins in my collection. But I only have 150 odd co proving covers. But do stamp dealers file them separately? Or are they just in amongst? Stamp dealers, most of them covers. haven't got this stuff. They, they ring up God and say, I've got this. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, I mean, I'm collecting the covers now. So is everyone else. So is a lot of other people, and they have a better collection than me. So, you know, it's it's just a matter of finding it. The common ones are there. One of the best ones I I have is what looks like a W. And initially on on the the, the catalog, it was classified as W1, the first W that they said they didn't know where it belonged to. But finally, they got a proving cover, and I, I've got a proving cover for that. And it's Victoria Varnish and Company. So it's not a W, oh. it's a VV that's joined oh. together. And uh, I've got one, hooray, <laughs> a Victoria Varnish. But I, I haven't put it on paper these yet. big companies had their own stamping machine. Oh yeah, they have their own cut punching cut machines. Punching machine They'd be very and early too, wouldn't they? Yeah. And again with the, the punching machines, some of them only have a single head punch. Yeah. Some of them would have double punches. Some like the the um, OS for the government was official service or the GNSW for the government New South Wales or the VG Victorian government. They had the multi-head punches, so they knew the size of the the sheet and there, so they had the punch made, so you can put the whole sheet in, one punch, and you've punched the whole sheet. For other companies, people who collect perfins, the, there's eight different ways you can get the perfin. So sometimes the office juniors would actually, if they only had a single punch, they'd fold over the one row and just punch the whole lot so they're saving themselves one punch. Sometimes they'd go through the trouble of concertining the, the whole, whole sheet and then punch it through but you know when you have eight or ten stamps and they're punching through that's when the pins get broken and things. Um, they don't always punch them when they put the sheets in, they have a full sheet 
face down. Sometimes it could have gone in the gum side down, so that the punch is different. Sometimes it's side on either side. So if the the fastidious collector, which I'm not, would want to have the same same pattern on eight different directions, on four on the front, four on the back, facing each way. I don't care. As as long as I have I'd like two examples of each on each value. So that, that's still pretty tough. Sure Even common ones. Alan and Jay didn't attempt to forge them. <laughs> I, I think they weren't that popular whilst he was busy doing other things because even today, a perfin isn't worth very much money. I mean, if I, I, I would pay a maximum of ten dollars for a rare one. A, a common one would be fifty cents. So, you know, uh, you, you're not going to make make a fortune by forging them. He was even doing that in Long Bay. He rang me up from Long Bay and asked me how many spaldings I bought. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Yep. So, I like everyone else. I, I brought in a, an album for you to go through if you can be bothered. We're running out of time anyway. So, okay. That's Thanks, it. Bro. Thank you. Okay. I don't um, know if you want another I'm going to hear from David Mee, like he used to come regularly. Uh, uh, right, right, right. Okay. Anybody, anybody want another cup anybody of tea? Anybody want another cup now? Or? Can I give that tank card for you? Up to you. No, on no, the list. For the next time. I'm sorry. It's best. Cuter. Yeah. With that oval. I don't remember saying the meeting. The next auction is not till January. The next auction is in January. January next year. Hello. 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 When I was a little boy, I lived in the country. And my recollection of one of the things that we did in the little country town is on a Saturday uh, at the matinee, we used to go to the, to the, to the local cinema and you know, go there and, and have, um, you know, watch, watch the newsreels and then we'd watch the feature film. And that was all okay, but, um, you know, oh, plus the fact that we used to always buy a choo-choo bar. You know, we used to sort of get stuck into that thing, and um, you know, we'd be eating it all afternoon. Because it was really solid, um, licorice stuff. But one of the things that we used to always do also in intermission, as well as getting the choo-choo bar, is we used to swap comics. Get $50. You know, and we used to it's always go to the, to the cinema with a stack of comics like that, and you'd go and trade them. With, with the other kids in the local town, right? so um, so I, you know, I quite enjoyed those comics, and yeah, well, you know, times times have changed, and um, you know, the comics disappeared, but um, just lately, I've come across Phantom Mac comics, right? Now these are starting to be reprinted, so um, so I'm starting to collect these ones now. Um, because of my earlier days of collecting comics and, um, you know, especially the Phantom comics. These are all, you know, as I say, re reproductions and some of them um, actually have the original um, cover of the, of the original sort of comic in there. So somebody's got a lot of archives and, yeah. But um, these things are basically red readily available now and, um, yeah, but they, they have all sorts of different types. You know, like this is the Phantom World, right? There's um, you know, probably um, you know, well, it's ten pages. So, you know, mind you, you know, you're paying ten dollars for these things now. So um. But are they in, they in a packet? No, you buy them individually. No, the, you buy them as is. They're like not this. in a envelope or something. No, 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 you buy it, buy it like because this. Sometimes they used to sell them. They know numbers on them? didn't open them. Oh, yeah, no, you, so you've, got, you've got numbers on them, like this one here is um, number 1,871. Yeah. Oh. Right? So, so um, yeah, there's a lot of them there. But I'm just seeing if we could um, find one. Yeah, like they, um, yeah, they, they have, the, like, the original, the original um, covers. 
that they used to have when they adapt the the the, um, the what's the name the, the 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 comic into this new one. Um, so yeah, I'm starting. Are you reading? No, not yet. I haven't had time to read them yet. <laughs> Thirty-six pages of the Phantom. Right? But um, you know, like they're all numbered, so you know you can you can get a proper proper series of these um, of these. Is there no room to put them? You get rid of some of my coin and banknote magazines, right? <laughs> <laughs> what about Superman and all the others? Oh, no, no, I'm going to stick with just the Phantom magazines. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that's what we're doing. But yeah, so um, yeah, with um, with my other interest in, in collecting, um, yeah, this is what I'm doing now. Phantom magazines. See so um, what's coming out of this? Like I'm saying, I I got really got got into birds again, mm -hmm. having. To, had them as a child. Yeah. You're doing this because of the. Uh, yeah, just when I was a kid. Yeah. But you know, like living in the country, you, you know, it wasn't a hell of a lot to do, especially in the summertime. You know, like you, you need to go to the swimming pool or you stay home. Yeah. And the local pool. Don't worry. Down the city, we went to the we went to the Rio Theatre in Le in Lane Cove. Mm -hmm. I was always known to get be taken by my five year old, five year older. Rather, mm -hmm. and then of course I'd want to go to the toilet at, at one of the crucial times, so I'd get into trouble from the other because he'd have to take me down to the toilet. Uh, 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 uh. So anyway. we'd go home and reenact Robin Hood and such <laughs> in one gala road. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not allowed to eat choo choo bars anymore. No. <laughs> They the break your teeth. The dentist charges too much. <laughs> I had comics in Hong Kong as well, but <clears throat> the the place I used to read the comics the most was in the barber shops. When whenever you went for a haircut there as a kid, they always had this stack of comics for you to read. So whilst they're cutting your hair, you're you're reading the comics. <laughs> and so you know, once a month you'd go for a haircut, and the, there's the next monthly comic there for Donald Duck or whatever it was. Put your little stool so you can sit up higher. Yeah. The extra little seat under the main seat. Uh, so anyway, the Phantom. It's, um, it's going to be reborn because um, whoever's printing them is, um, is obviously got a lot of the old, old records. The old I wonder ladies. why they didn't start at number one. Maybe they didn't have it. No. <laughs> no, I just, what's what's you know, the saying from the Phantom? Sorry? What's the saying? Of the Phantom. Yeah. He, he goes who to walks and he goes to walks. No, it's the ghost who walks. Was he supposed to be visible or something? No, he was a ghost. It was the ghost who walks. Yeah. yeah he who cannot die because it was always the father and son and would take over the reins from yeah. the next generation. So that's why they thought that he never mm. died. Hey, I, I know something about comics too. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, if you ever find a Phantom magazine, let me know. Terrific. Well, an original. Original? Yeah. Oh, and Paul from Bucks, those things they do these days. Stick them in the yeah, well, that's the problem, you know, like this, you know, like, you know, the original ones, you know, the staplers, the staplers would be all rusted and, you know, like they'd be pretty tattered. You know, I remember, you know, we, we, we'd be trading the comics all the time and, you know, like, invariably pages would get torn out and everything else. So, Apparently, the Phantom is very popular with the Australian Aboriginal community, uh, and so they get some medical information via cartoon characters like the Phantom uh, to get them to do certain things. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, Morris. When, when we visited um, clients, at one stage we went up to Mount Isa on a couple of occasions. <laughs> You know, this is from the coin colony days. And at that stage, the Aborigines had to walk on one side of the street and the white people on the other but, but when we talked to some of the news agents, that was the big thing. When the, when the Aborigines got their cheque, they'd go down and buy comics. They, they were selling a huge amount of comics to Aborigines. And of course, the grog was another go. Yeah. I was on a when we went up to Lightning Ridge, that uh, went into the bar, into the, the bottle shop there, and it was all wired up, and they had a um, a chute. And we go, what nice this, you know? 
And I said, well, you've got to have it for, uh, because of the Aborigines. And they said, but don't worry now because the government's bought them their own hotel. They've got their own hotel up the road. We don't, we don't, don't see many of them. I was on a camping holiday and naturally I'd been into the hotel and stood by the bar. I said, oh, you're lucky it's only three o'clock in the afternoon because this end of the bar is the blacks only bar. Mm. But we'll serve you here because they, no one's here. So we have come a long way. Yes. Mm. We okay. haven't had them in rugby league terms. Thank you all for coming to the meeting. Um, well, close the meeting and um, uh, thanks to the new committee that um, we're going to have another 12 yeah. months of oh. mm. All right. Thank you. You might have to edit some of that.